If you want to express complex, subtle, nuanced ideas in written English, let's say, it helps immensely if you have a strong understanding of what words mean in the language and phrases and how people are likely to interpret those words and phrases. It helps immensely if you know something about the structure of the language, the fact that English has nouns and verbs and how those are related, what an adjective is, what's the use of an adjective, and what's the use of an adverb, that English sentences are subject, verb, object, as opposed to, say, Japanese, which is subject, object, verb, word order. It helps immensely to know something about style, especially if you're writing a long, complicated document like a book that might have things like indexes and cross-references and so forth. What do other people expect to see in the organization of such a large document? In the case of computer programs, it goes beyond that because not only are we writing computer programs so that other people can understand those programs because most programming, most large programs are done in such a way that other people are going to have to read the programs or maintain them or change them. Besides that, you have this extremely picky computer that's going to ultimately run the code that you wrote, either interpret it, compile your program to some other language, which is then eventually interpreted in the hardware of the processor. And that computer is extremely picky. And so not only do you need to know about usage and style, but you need to know, according to the computer, according to the programming language, the person who created the compiler or interpreter, you need to know exactly what those words mean or the instructions mean, you need to know it inside and out because the computer is going to interpret your program in some way. And if you don't understand exactly what the computer is going to do, then it's extremely unlikely that for any program more complicated than Hello World, the computer is gonna do exactly what you expect for all inputs. So. There's no way to write a computer program that is going to behave the way you want if you don't understand the language you're using. In the computer programming world, that means that if you're using a programming language, you need to be able to do things like read the language specification and understand it. Some programming languages have formal specifications. They're written in math or logic. There are also informal specifications their tutorials, their various manuals, and so forth. You should also feel comfortable writing little test programs to test your understanding of how the programming language, the compiler, the interpreter, the runtime, so forth, work. That's an important skill. And if you don't have those skills, if you can't read a specification, if you don't know enough to be able to write little test programs, or if you don't have that approach in your mind, then you're constantly going to be, you know, rolling the dice and hoping that whatever you've written down in your editor actually means what you think it does to the computer when it's run. It's hard enough if you know the semantics. It's hard enough if you really understand your programming language inside and out to be able to write a program that does what you intend for all inputs. That's an extremely difficult challenge. To do that when you don't understand your language, your medium of discourse, the mechanism by which you're interacting with your computer system is basically impossible for any, any non-trivial program. That alone is justification for why it's essential for every programmer to understand the languages they're using. And in practice, you're not going to use one language if you're working on a large, com complicated project. When I worked at a startup company, at one point I counted, I was using 20 different programming languages. I didn't have to program in all 20 languages, but I had to be able to read the code and understand it. There were database languages like SQL and PLSQL. There were XML manipulation languages like XSLT. We had 
Java and Python and all sorts of scripting languages and tool command languages and so forth. And so I needed to be able to understand and be fluent enough in those languages that I could be productive and that I wasn't going to introduce errors in the software. I wasn't going to introduce security flaws in the software. So how do I learn 20 different languages? Well, the way you learn 20 different languages is to understand the fundamentals, to understand concepts like lexical scope and dynamic scope and call by value versus call by reference. So know what the difference is between a statement and an expression and between an expression and a value. All those different things, just like if you really want to become a good writer in English, it's really helpful to know what a verb is and to know what an adverb is and things like that. Most computer programs are not written by humans, but are rather written by other computer programs. I remember an example that Kent David gave, which is every time you print a document to a laser printer, first of all, there's a piece of software, your word processor or type setting system or part of your operating system or your web browser or whatever, there is a compiler that is compiling or producing a document, which is a computer program in some domain specific language for rendering documents like PostScript or PDF. So there's a comp compilation step. And then that computer program is being sent to the laser printer, which has a computer on it, which is running an interpreter for that programming language, maybe PDF. And so the document is parsed, it's interpreted, and the instructions result in the laser's movement and the charging of the drum and picking up toner and all that stuff, all the electromechanical parts of a laser printer. But it's all controlled by an interpreter. So just printing a document to a laser printer, which isn't something we think of as being all that complicated, involves compilation, domain-specific languages, parsing, interpretation. In fact, there are a number of critical security flaws and vulnerabilities in that process that have been discovered. This technique of writing computer programs that generate other computer programs is extremely powerful, and it's also ubiquitous in modern computing infrastructure. The study of writing programs that manipulate other programs is the field of programming languages. The study of how to write interpreters and parsers and compilers is the field of programming languages. If you programmed a computer decades ago, you might have programmed the computer by connecting wires in a plug board. That was a great advance over computers that couldn't be programmed at all. When I was a kid, the technology had advanced and we had things like Atari 2600 or Atari VCS video game systems that you could actually buy for your house, powered by a MOS Technologies 6507, which had about 3,500 transistors. And you could play games like Video Olympics, which showed that you could have 50 different games as long as they're all some variant of Pong. If you compare that sort of hardware to what we have today, it's amazing because my iPhone has about 12 billion transistors as opposed to 3,500 for the Atari. The Atari had 128 bytes of RAM. The laptop I'm recording on this, this video on, has 64 gigabytes of RAM. So it has about 500 million times as much memory as my first video game system. The way you interact with a modern computer with this level of scale and complexity has to be different than when you're programming something like the Atari 2600. Let's look at a game called River Raid. 
which was one of the better games for sure. And I'll start it, and then I will, well, I immediately crash, but let's go to the debugger, and we can see the entire state of the machine. There you go. That's the full 128 bytes of RAM. You can see the registers for the CPU and the 6507 or 6502 assembly. You can see the state of all of the hardware registers and hardware settings and the input-output registers and so forth. This is the whole system. You can easily fit this into your head. No one understands how a modern CPU works, even the people who make the CPUs. This is something that Tom Knight told me. No one understands how an Intel CPU works, including the people at Intel. No one human understands it all. It's too complicated, far too complicated. We need different techniques than if we were programming something like the 2600. Now, that's not to say that the 2600 was easy to program. It was by no means easy to program, but many of those games for the 2600 were created by a single programmer. That's not possible any, anymore for a video game or an operating system or something like that on modern hardware that really takes use of or takes advantage of the entire system. So we need more sophisticated techniques. Programming languages gives you leverage over complexity, allows you to create new abstractions. Abstraction is how we deal with complexity. That's why we're not writing machine code. We're dealing with higher level concepts. For example, here is a little program in a programming language called Minikanran, which is a language I work on with other people. And this is a, an embedded domain-specific language for what's called constraint logic programming. If I look at this little program, you know, it's what, eight lines of code, something like that, seven lines of code. Even if you don't understand what the program does or the language, you can understand it's a relatively short program. This program is written as what's called a macro, or at least parts of it are. So the condi, the fresh, those are what are called macros. Those are some syntactic abstractions that the programming language scheme provides. So I can define this relation, but I can also call expand, which is built into the scheme host language, and expand this code to see what it looks like in the underlying scheme implementation. And now you can see it. So that seven lines of code expanded to this much more complicated um, set of code. And I can go even lower level if I want. Let me grab my magic. If I turn the magic on, now I can go back to the original definition. And when I execute that, I see the intermediate language, which is something close to the assembly language that Shea Scheme generates from that code. So the macro is going to expand to lower level scheme code. That scheme code was going to be optimized. A whole bunch of things are gonna happen. And then at the end, we get this intermediate language for x86 or whatever. And uh, so you can see that we had seven lines of code turning into, I don't even know how to easily count this, but you can see that it's over a thousand lines of code. So seven lines of code turns into a thousand lines of this intermediate level. And if you compiled it all the way to machine code, it's gonna be even larger and more complicated. So that's the sort of abstraction that a language can give you to deal with complexity. And in fact, you can build additional higher level languages on top of say mini Canron. We have different languages we build on top of it to make it higher level, to make it more restrictive. So you can't express certain types of, of programs that might result in errors to allow you to write things that are syntactically nicer and so forth. And then you can build languages on top of that. In fact, the Racket um, researchers 
have a racket manifesto where they talk about designing systems as towers of domain-specific languages. And then the racket compiler itself or the racket implementation itself is a tower of languages. The new racket is built on Shea Scheme, but on top of Shea Scheme, there's this powerful macro system. And then the macro system is used to build other parts of, of racket and so forth. So the idea that you can use programming languages to give you higher levels of abstraction is critical to modern programming. We don't program these systems the same way we program an Atari 2600. It's just not feasible. As Rich Hickey says, software development is an economic activity. If you were programming a modern piece of software in the same way that you programmed a 128-byte uh, Atari 2600, you would never finish the software. You would never get anywhere. And also, your software wouldn't be portable. You couldn't run it on different hardware, so forth. So we have to have abstraction. Programming languages, one great way to get leverage on complexity through abstraction. An important thing that you can do with languages is restrict the languages so that the language has less power. This is a very important concept. It might seem strange. Why would you want to have a language with less power? It turns out that all of the mainstream languages, general purpose languages that you might use, like Java, Python, C++, C Sharp, so forth, JavaScript, those are what are called Turing complete languages. You have full expressive power in those languages to write any sort of what's called a computable function in those languages. All of those languages in some sense are equivalent in power. But the problem is in all of those languages, you can write programs that go into an infinite loop. They run forever without ever you know, finishing their task. Sometimes you want that power, but sometimes you don't. If you're doing a database lookup, if you're trying to look up information in a table, maybe you don't want that lookup to go into an infinite loop. So you can use a more restrictive language, such as SQL, the structured query language, where in basic SQL, every query is guaranteed to terminate. The same with the data log language as well. Regular expression languages, you know, uh, regex languages also have this property. Minikanran, this language which I'm showing, has a bunch of interesting properties. In particular, in this language, which is in some sense has certain uh, structural properties that you can that give you guarantees that you can count on, you're allowed to reorder the code in a way that wouldn't make sense in most programming languages. You're allowed to reorder code uh, almost arbitrarily and your program still has certain guarantees. And this is because the language is restricted. So through the design of languages, towers of languages, increasing abstraction, and also intentionally reducing the power of languages we can get a handle on the tremendous complexity and scale of modern software systems. Type systems are another way to restrict the power of languages so that we can say things about the languages and say things about the programs in the languages that otherwise we wouldn't be able to say. So this study of restrictions to languages the study of the design of domain-specific languages and how you construct and implement those languages and how you can use languages as a powerful technique to control complexity, to tame complexity of these systems, that's really at the heart of the study of programming languages.